Hey, good morning. Hey, yeah, right. Uh, it's Sunday, and I don't know if anyone was up early enough to see the sunrise this morning. Oh my gosh, it looks spectacular. Um, but I'm reminded every time I see an incredible sunrise that like the sun rising every day, God's grace is fresh and new. And so we're going to actually uh, sing about that today. But before we do that, I just want to share a few announcements. Um, but if I've not had the chance to meet you, my name's Christian. I'm on staff here. Uh, and we're just so glad that you guys are here. Uh, if this is your first time, maybe, maybe you've been hanging out with us for the past few weeks. We would love to connect with you. You can fill out a connect card uh, right out there in the foyer. We have some wonderful greeters. Uh, you can ask any questions, submit prayer requests, and maybe you're online. You can actually click a button at the top of your screen. Pretty nifty in my opinion. Um, but we just want to share a couple ways that we can connect with you here at the CLC. The first thing I want to mention is that this Tuesday at from 1030 to noon is the last kids worship and movement class. And so kids, we've had a lot of kids participating in this. It's been really awesome. Sometimes you see them leading in worship up here on stage. And so this Tuesday is the last one. So we, you want to make sure you mark your calendar, set a reminder, and come out for that this Tuesday. Also wanted to mention that today, after church, Lincoln University students are moving into their dorms. And in the last couple of years, we've been kind of helping out with this. Now, we've been letting you guys know a little last minute. We apologize for that. But we want to let you know that anyone is welcome uh, to go over there and move. I didn't drink any protein shakes this morning, so I feel like I'm not equipped for it. But I'm going to be there, and a bunch of people are going to be there to help them move into their dorms. It's just a great way to love on that community and serve our community. And so that's that's taking place today. I think I heard their next kind of phase for moving is at 1 p.m., although I'm sure if you show up at any point in time, they could put you to work. And there's, you probably have a lot of questions like, where do I park? Where do I go? What are we doing? Uh, you can actually check out our latest newsletter on our website to find out all that information. And there's a really cool map, too, if you're prone to getting lost like me. And so uh, that's at clcfamily.church slash news. You can find more out for that. I want to mention one, uh, one last thing. CLC Recovery, uh, they are a class that meets here. They're resuming their class, Life Healing Choices, uh, this Wednesday at 6.30, uh, right here in the sanctuary. Anybody is invited to that. But I also wanted to mention, you probably saw them out there in the lobby, uh, Celebrate Recovery is coming back this October. So if you are a person with hurts, hang-ups, or habits, just like any of us, right, and we all have those things, uh, this is just a great space in a community to grow and find uh, camaraderie and just hopefully continue the journey well. And so if you want more information about that, they're actually right out there in the lobby. Some dear friends of mine who would be glad to answer any questions that you have. Does that sound okay? Yeah. yeah? Okay, okay. Uh, at this time, we're going to turn our attention and prepare our hearts. We're going to slow down and celebrate the God whose grace is new every day. Amen? Amen. Good morning, church. Would you please be encouraged by uh, our call to worship this morning? Would you join me as we read these slides, please? To all who are weary and need rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who feel worthless and wonder if God cares, to all who fail and desire strength, to all who sin and need a savior. This church opens wide her doors with a welcome from Jesus Christ, the ally of his enemies, the defender of the guilty, the justifier of the inexcusable, the friend of sinners. Welcome, welcome. Be encouraged by that. Church, would you please rise and join us as we begin our time together?
thank you for your reckless love that we can be reminded that it's all for you, Jesus. It's all for you. It's all in you. It's all about you. God, I just ask that you would speak to our hearts this morning, Lord. I ask that whatever we bring in this morning, that we could just lay it at the feet of Jesus. That you could speak to our hearts, our minds, our souls. That you could fill us up. And that we could go out into the world, into our week, and pour out your love onto others, God. We thank you for the opportunity to be able to do that. It's a blessing. It's a gift. It's a privilege. And so, God, this morning, we thank you. We thank you and we love you. We are reminded of who you are and who we are because of you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. And at this time, the children in middle school are dismissed. Oh, thank you so much, our, our worship team. We are so blessed with the riches of that team. And um, I just love not only how God has given them the skill of music, but a heart to just erase that boundary between us, the congregation, and them on the platform. We're just one big worship team. And uh, that is such a delight to participate in. And I want to continue in a very holy moment that we have as a congregation. Um, the Bible makes it very clear that the local church cannot go forth unless it is led by a plurality of leaders. And those leaders, uh, the New Testament calls the elders of the church. They arise from the congregation. Uh, they give life and breadth and representation to the congregation, especially to the heart of the Lord. Uh, and I just want to say, in, in just the few months we've been here, the elders who have been called uh, to serve as your leaders have really touched uh, both my wife and my heart uh, with just the narrative of how they are seeking to live out the gospel and to serve you. Uh, you have been served so well by those who are, your elders serve three-year terms, and you think back three years ago, 2019, do you want to be serve as an elder? You have no idea what's going to happen in those three years. <laughs> and we're celebrating uh, the completion of uh, the, the term that started in 2019 for L.K. Jordan, for Brooke Seeger, uh, and for Crystal Leff. Uh, and today, I just want us to practice Romans 12.10, and maybe there are other ways that we can sustain appreciation for them. Uh, but Romans 12.10 says that we are to compete in one thing. We're to outdo one another in showing honor. Uh, and Paul says of trusted workers, he says these individuals are worthy of honor. And, and I just want to say those three individuals, Brooke, LK, and Crystal, are worthy of honor for how they have served and walked with the Lord. And it wasn't exactly a very easy three years <laughs> to be an elder of the church. Lots of Zoom meetings, uh, lots of things that were difficult to deal with. And so let's just acknowledge before the Lord as we thank God for them. Let's put our hands together and give praise for these three. And so we come to the point of a culmination of a spiritual process. I just want to say as, a, as one of the newest people here, um, it was gratifying for me to watch and experience and be part of what was a very spirit-led process. I was very struck by the fact that it was someone else leading that process, not, not the existing elder team, not even the nominating team, but it was a sense of the Holy Spirit making clear individuals who were being called and then the reception of that call. And a part of that call is that we have a voice affirmation, and that's what this moment is prepared for. Uh, it's a little different than what we often think of an American election. You have parties and you vote for your person and that kind of thing. Uh, in the New Testament, the way election of leaderships is envisioned, as I understand it from Acts 6, 
It's more of, of a, something that we don't hear as much these days. In a wedding, sometimes you'll hear the preacher say, if anyone has any reason why this couple should not be jo- lawfully joined, right? <laughs> have you ever been in a wedding where that happened? <laughs> I have a friend who was officiating and he said, yeah, they had, they had somebody say, I have a reason. <laughs> and they said, okay, everybody just hang tight. We're gonna go to the back room <laughs> and have a discussion. And that in a sense is, is what I think the Bible has in mind of saying, hey, we're public. These are individuals we believe God has equipped and called. Their names have been announced to you for a few weeks. I hope you've had a chance to read their bios and their, their Q&As about how God has led them. And then out of that uh, prayerful process, uh, there's the point of the question of affirmation. And so uh, I believe I see all three of them here. So I'm going to ask them if they would stand at this point so you can locate them. Uh, If Scott DeHart would stand, if Mindy Myers would stand, if Seth McNaughton would stand. Uh, Those are your three that have been announced. Uh, And so they have agreed and they have said yes to put their names forward. But now I need to put the question to you. Uh, Do you affirm this slate of elders Seth McNaughton, Scott DeHart, and Mindy Myers, uh, as called by God and received as your elders, as the team that God has appointed to serve you in leading the church? Uh, if so, signify by saying, I. I. And is anyone opposed? Praise God. He has called this team. And it's so uh, appropriate. I've asked Crystal Leff if she would come forward. Crystal is serving the children where she is. She's, uh, Crystal preached one of the most powerful sermons I've ever heard uh, because just after she got out of, out of surgery, before she really was, she was serving on Wednesday night at Cal. And I was like, that is a sermon. <laughs> that is a powerful sermon. And so we're so thankful for you. And so I thought it would be very good for one who knows what it is to serve as an elder uh, to pray for our incoming team and pray for our church. So, Crystal, if you would lead us. Um, Do you want Mindy and Seth and Scott to come forward? Since they're here, come on. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. All right, Peggy. (laughs) Um, All right. Let us pray. All praise, honor, and glory be unto you, our Lord, our Savior, and our Counselor. Oh, thank you for blessing us with this place where we can gather to praise you in worship. Lord, I, um, I thank you. I thank you for the nominating committee for their faithful service, and for submitting to your leadings. Lord, I thank you for raising up Mindy, Scott, and Seth. I thank you for the affirmations that you have blessed them with um, as they humbly and prayerfully sought your will in this calling. Thank you for this morning, Lord. Lord, as... um, as Mindy and Scott and Seth step out on this path that you have placed before them. We ask that they be blessed with wisdom and discernment as they serve you and this family. Lord, may their path be illuminated um, by your light, by the light of your Lord. Holy Spirit, may your peace guide and sustain them as they serve you and this family. Lord, we pray for spiritual hedge of protection around Mindy, Scott, and Seth and their families. Let no schemes or distractions of the enemy um, prevail. Lord, we thank you for them, and we lift this all to you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Praise God. And we will have a setting apart an ordination service coming up in the future as well. So, you know what? 
I've been looking for this other pew Bible. This is not my daily Bible. I'd be in trouble if it was, but I couldn't find it all week. And that is just the status of this move. Uh, I want you to know we reached one milestone this week. Is Last night I spent my first night in a local temporary uh, rental here. So I'm moving toward that point of no more commute. And um, our, our schnauzer, if you know anything about schnauzers, they're busy buddies and they have to be in control of everything. And he is very upset because all the furniture is out of the house. We've got uh, a single bed in Doylestown and a couple air mattresses and then a bunch of boxes, you know. <laughs> That's the boxes that kill you at the end, right? But everything else is either in storage or in this sweet little place that we're so thankful for just less than a mile from here for us to be able to have an unrushed, you know, search for a longer term place. But our schnauzer is wondering like, what is going on? <laughs> You know, my favorite couch that I used to not be able to sit on, but then you all gave in. Like, you know, you know, you know what happens. Um, and he's wondering, what in the world is happening? And uh, so it's just part of that process. But as of uh, Friday, sometime before noon, uh, we won't have any place to stay in Doylestown. So we end a blessed uh, season of ministry and life there. Uh, and are just so gratified to be able to make this move with you. We are so thankful for this call. We are so excited. Um, and I just, uh, I'm so charged up as I drive into this place and think of all of you and think of the new and exciting narrative of ministry in front of us. And we're, we're, we're in this series called The Why, and I'm gonna look at a passage that is just central to understanding what Jesus' ministry of the church is. And it's from Matthew chapter nine, and uh, I've called it Pray for the Laborers, but it really sets up the whole commission and work of the Church of Jesus Christ. Uh, and so uh, follow along, and we're going to dig into this passage, uh, because this really expresses the task that Jesus gave to us and the way, the lens through which he saw the world. Uh, and I love his realism here because it sounds like such an overwhelming task, what you're going to see. It sounds ridiculously overwhelming. Uh, but I want you to see what he does with it. Uh, so let's read, starting at verse 34, hear the God's word. But the Pharisees said, uh, it is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. But Jesus went through all the towns and villages. Um, just want you to understand, there were 204 towns and villages. <laughs> so this is not a small thing. He went through all their towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Let us pray. Father, would you teach us? Would you fill us? Would you show us the heart of Christ and transpose and transmit that to us? We ask that you would use your word and that only that which is in accordance with its fullness and power would go forth here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I want to submit to you a, a distinction this morning between a convert, someone who has just accepted Jesus, and a disciple. And here is the distinction. A convert is somebody who has received Jesus Christ into their heart. It's someone who's practiced Romans 10.10. 10. If you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's conversion. But a disciple is somebody who hasn't simply received Jesus into their heart, so to speak, but a disciple is someone who says, Lord, I want you to put your heart in me. Do you see the difference? And it's, it's a pivot point for what a disciple is. A disciple is somebody who says, I want the heart of Jesus to be in my heart. 
I want to live my life. I want to look at people. I want to spend the resources he has given me the way Jesus would live my life if he were living my one solitary life. That's a disciple. And this passage tells us, uh, gives us a unique lens to how Jesus moved about the world. Again, uh, we see uh, in verse 35, it says that he was going through all the villages and towns. There was no place uncovered. There was no place too humble for Jesus to go. Here's what I would say. There are no little places, just like there are no little pieces or no little people. Um, Because any place that a consecrated person, consecrated to Jesus Christ goes, all of a sudden that place is supercharged with reality. And Jesus went through all of these little villages. I don't know if you you look at the uh, population of now, Lincoln University, it's about 6,000 people, but all these little housing developments. <laughs> Jesus was a walkabout preacher. <laughs> and he, went, he, w- he was not somebody who just cubbyholed himself off on a mountaintop. He got up before dawn and did that, but he was out among the people. He was accessible and he was walking about and he was engaging with people right where they lived and were. And then out of that, he was gathering them and teaching in their synagogues. The synagogues were places, a place of the central teaching of the word of God. And now I believe that has been displaced by the church, those that God has gathered together, not so much buildings, but the gathering of God's people together to be taught the word. And that word is the proclamation of the good news of a kingdom. <laughs> that Jesus reigns and rules, and that is good news. And that means that every disease and every sickness is to be overthrown. The word there for healing is uh, the word we get therapy from, and what it means that Jesus is coming to lift up, every place there's misery, Jesus is coming to displace that misery. And so imagine Jesus, he's, gone through all the villages and towns, and he has encountered every form of human misery, everything that weighs us down, the depression, the anxiety, the grief, the loneliness, um, the habits of addiction that uh, initially were choices and then they become iron bars that enslave, um, the broken relationships, uh, the, the broken resolution and resolve, the, the broken lives. He's, he's around all of it, and, he's, and then he's teaching the word of God, and there's this moment, and verse 36 tells us, it says that there's this moment when Jesus locked eyes on the multitudes. It says when he, he, he saw the crowds, and we read an interpretation of Jesus' inner life that first of all is never made of another person in the New Testament. Uh, In fact, what it tells us was going on in Jesus' life is not found in any other piece of ancient literature. These words had to be created to describe something otherworldly that was going on inside of Jesus that was, was not even a common phrase. And it was the phrase that when he saw the crowds, he didn't retreat in disgust, He didn't advance with a sense of imperial honor. You need to honor me. You need to honor God. He didn't didn't advance with that kind of regal authority. But what happened to him was when 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 he locked eyes on the multitude, it says that there was this, it was like his insides were being ripped apart. And and it uses a a noun, (laughs) For, for your guts, for your inner life. And it says that Jesus' guts were twisted all apart uh, out of compassion. And it, it, this, this word splankna, and it, it created a verb, splanknizomai, and it says Jesus was moved with this. And this is the most frequent description of the emotional life of Jesus it precedes him taking the step of intervention. Before he intervenes in a broken life, he is moved in this way. It's the description of him when the leper came and, and fell down at his feet. Uh, and, and, and Jesus said, do you want to be clean? And he said, I do. And it says Jesus was moved with compassion and he touched the leper. Or, or when two blind beggars in Matthew 20 
were um, begging, uh, and Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? And we read that as he saw their plight, um, unable to see, unable to make a living, it says that he was moved with compassion from the inside, and then he said, receive your sight. Um, when the uh, man possessed by a demon, recorded in Mark chapter five, uh, who was so afflicted that uh, he lived among the tombs and he was self-destructive, he hated himself, he cut himself, uh, and he had to be restrained with chains. Uh, and uh, when Jesus um, cast out the demons from him, and, and remember they were legion, they went into the pigs, uh, this man begged Jesus for one thing, he wanted to follow Jesus. Uh, and he said, let me follow you. And Jesus' words to this man were, go home and tell your family. He said, no, you, you're not allowed to follow me uh, by leaving your family. He says, go home and tell your family what wonderful things God has done for you. And in Mark 5, 19, it says, and how he has had compassion on you. That it is the compassion of God. I, I want you to realize that the only reason you and I are alive and have breath today is because of the compassion of God. The only reason that we can lift up praise for salvation is because the compassion of Jesus um, ruled over our need and brokenness and caused him to intervene. And, and I believe if, again, if Christ's heart is beating in our heart, we will be like him. Jesus was not a physician of souls who had more skill than heart. Um, I like what Thomas Watson says. He says, every groan of the patient entered the heart of this physician. <laughs> I want a physician like that. <laughs> Jesus was moved when he, when he, when he saw um, whatever form of misery there was, his heart was agitated with commiseration for those who suffered. This is not used of another human being. Uh, up to history now, this is not used of anyone else. Uh, it's certainly not used of anybody else in the Gospels. It, it means that God's movement toward us, and make no mistake, uh, like C.S. Lewis says, we are not searching for God. We're searching for God the way a mouse searches for a cat. <laughs> he is on the move for us. He is coming after us. He looks at the brokenness of our life and we think that that would just repulse him and revulse him and he would be turning away, uh, but he sees the very needs and brokenness and the cycles uh, that we get caught up in and our relapses after we've resolved, I'm never doing that again. He looks at all of that and, and this is the same Jesus now who is on the throne and he looks at it and he is moved with compassion. And what is true of him for these individuals, the leper, the demoniac, the blind man, is true when he sees the crowds. <laughs> and I wanna just tell you, um, crowds do not bring out the best in me. I have, in a sense, even retreated during the pandemic, and now, I, the other day, I wound up being in a crowd of people at Christiana Mall, and I was like, whoa. <laughs> um, I do not like this. I'm not a shopper anyway, but, um, and my wife is a very skillful shopper. Uh, when the pandemic started and we all were afraid, you know, are there enough ventilators for whatever this mysterious thing is? It was my wife who went into the store with her mask and her gloves and wiped everything down with Clorox, right? I was the noble husband I prayed for, um, <laughs> but I wasn't doing that. Um, and and it, was, it was oppressive, it was difficult, right? But now that, you know, multitudes don't bring out the best in me. Le leaving a crowded event and the cars are bumper to bumper it doesn't bring out the best in me, but maybe it brings out something that's true in me, and that is that I need to see people through the lens of what, how Jesus sees people. Jesus sees this multitude, and he is moved with compassion, and he sees them as helpless and harassed. Uh, these two words uh, are a progression of need. Um, the first word that's often translated har harassed and helpless, the word, the word harassed means like somebody who is walking about with difficulty through life. Um, it, it's someone, the, the, the harassment is, 
If you think of someone who can barely put the next foot forward, who's maybe um, moving uh, with pain and a cane, that's, that's harassment. That's how Jesus saw our spiritual condition. And helpless is like somebody went and struck them down and now they're on the ground. That, that's how Jesus described our spiritual, that's basically our, our spiritual description. <laughs> we were either barely moving uh, and, and with every step bewildered, or, or we are knocked down. <laughs> and, and I want you to see what he says. He says, like sheep without a shepherd. Do you know how, you know what makes a people harassed or helpless? It's not having a shepherd. It's not having Jesus in their life. We, we live in a world where the gospel is obscured. Martin Luther put it this way. He says, the gospel is crucified between two thieves, <laughs> And on the, on the one hand, we have kind of the permissive um, view of things that has crept into large swaths of the church where um, everything is lax, everything is lenient. You know, God used to have some moral scruples, but he's, you know, he's taken some anti-anxiety medication and he's loosened up. And so he's flexed and, 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 and so these kind of churches and these kind of spiritualities proclaim that we live in a tabulous, a, a tabulous moral reference point and whatever you want goes. And the important thing is just to love everybody exactly according to however they want to live and however they are. And so, uh, so these people have no shepherd. <laughs> And that's one side of missing the gospel. And then the other side of the gospel are religious leaders that see people who are um, harassed, moving about with pain, and what they do for the harassment is they lay extra burdens on their back. Jesus spoke about this in Matthew 23. He says, woe to you teachers of the law who lay cumbersome burdens on the backs of others and do not even lift a finger to help them. And, and this, you might say, is, is a form of legalism, uh, of, of saying, you know, you need to pull yourself together. You need to straighten up. You need to get your life together. You need to live up to God's expectations. Both of them are shepherdless ways of living. If, if you live as if there's no taboos, you get to call the shots. Um, you are your own Lord. And, and if, if you live as if you can somehow pay God off and make it, you are living as your own savior. And both of them are simply different ways of being lost. And, but here's the amazing thing. Jesus looks at both and he doesn't turn away in disgust or approach in condemnation, but he is moved with compassion. He, he looks at the root cause. And what I find so stunning here is his view of them uh, is that this is an overwhelming task. Look at verse 37. Verse 37, he says to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but workers are hardly there. So first of all, I love his realism because this is an impossible task. The, but, but he doesn't blame the harvest. He says the harvest is plentiful. Elsewhere, he says the, the fields of grain are white to harvest. I think so many sections of the Christian church fall into the temptation where they've traded the Great Commission for admonition, <laughs> where, where they look at the state of the world and they're sour and they're hopeless and they move in condemnation and accusation and admonition. <laughs> That's not how Jesus looked at it. He said, the harvest. He says, the problem is not with the harvest. <laughs> Today, if maybe 10% of the people in the zip code of Lincoln University or uh, New London Township, if 10% of them go to church, the problem is not because the 90% are so defective and they're unreachable. And, and, and they bought a line of propaganda that now they aren't receptive. Jesus does not say that. Jesus says the problem, the, the reason that people are not seeking God, he says, is that the workers are few. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying it's impossible, but then his solution is so gorgeous, so graceful. And if you know anything about farming, and I bet a lot of you know a whole lot more than me, 
One thing that the commentators pick up is they say, harvesting is pretty much the farming for dummies role. I don't need to know a lot to be a harvester. I yesterday picked cherry tomatoes. I did that when I was three or four years old. <laughs> but if, if you know, like I'm into like growing the kind of tomatoes that are a little complex and whatever, and man, you ought to see me. When I get some real estate here, like it'll be like the bone meal and the mix of fertilizer and uh, the initial spray to make sure that the tomato plant I bought did not uh, have some kind of virus. There's all kinds of science that I wanna do and I wanna do right. And I'm, I'm so curious about it. That's really hard. Even the accumulation of the soil, I'm crazy about like, where did this manure come from? What did the cows eat that produced this manure? Like all that, like I'm into the science, right? All that stuff. And, um, and the growing of the plant and, and the feeding of the plant and a, a science for watering the plant, right? Those, you could have a degree in agronomy and still be learning forever how to do this. But to pick a tomato, anybody can do it. And, and this is such a beautiful description, he says, the harvest is plentiful, um, but the workers are few. And then what would you expect him to say when he's looked at all this misery and he's been so touched by it? You would think that he would say, pray for the harvest. But Jesus did not seem to have any concern about whether the harvest was willing to come to him. His concern was whether the people who already were harvested were willing to work for him. We're willing to engage in the work of discipleship and bringing other people in. His concern is not for lost people. His concern is for the people who profess to be his church. Do you see that? It's, it's like Jesus sees all these people drowning and he doesn't say pray for the people drowning. He says pray for the lifeguards. It's like Jesus sees all these people sick and ill and he, he doesn't say pray for the sick and ill. He says, pray for the nurses and doctors. <laughs> this is such a beautiful mandate for the church. He looks at the helpless and he says, pray for the helpers. He looks at the harassed and he says, pray for those who will lift this burden from their back. And Jesus sees the crowds and basically, to do a riff on MLK, he says, I have a dream. <laughs> I want to build a movement judged not by the quantity of the worshipers, but by the quality of those who live out a life of worship, gathering those who have not yet been gathered. Jesus is looking at all of those who are scattered, and he says, my church, I want my church to be known not for its seating capacity, not for the people who fill seats, but I want my church to be known for its sending capacity for how my people will live. And friends, I think that coming out of the pandemic and maybe coming out of a culture where we've measured church more by attendance and by really what a friend of mine calls vanity statistics that we probably shouldn't even keep track of all that much because they don't really mean a lot. We don't know how big the church at Ephesus was or Antioch or any of these places, but what we do know is we know that Antioch was ascending church and they sent their best. We know that we, we, we know the nature of the church and it's been so much in our day that the, the church has basically set up shop and if you, if you have a kick and worship band and a pastor who can give a talk a little bit like a TED talk and a place for the kids to camp out, you can get a lot of bodies accumulated in that. And look, I love that the band sounds good. I'm really into teaching that is accessible. I want a place for children to be ministered to. But what has happened is the church has started to look a lot more like a rotary club, a rotary, rotary club with a rock band then the ecclesia that Jesus said would disrupt the brokenness in the lives of multitudes. And I love what he says when he says the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. He doesn't say, pray for the experts. It's not what he says. 
He doesn't say, pray you get some good strategies. He's simply saying, pray that I'll have people who are willing to take the next step in obedient lifestyle of, of submission to my lordship. Pray that I have people who would be willing to be stunned by the fact that I have noticed them and that they start to notice other people and to give their lives out for that. And when a whole body of people do this, there will be an abundant harvest. I'm gonna share a feel-good story. You guys want a feel-good story about America? There's so much bad news. I love this story. And uh, my friend Quentin Steve, who pastors a church in Des Moines, Iowa, is the first one who turned me on to this story. I didn't know about it. Maybe some of you do. But in, uh, <clears throat> in World War II, a couple weeks after Pearl Harbor, there was a little town in North uh, La Platte, uh, Nebraska. Uh, and they heard that their infantry, the 134th infantry was gonna be coming through on a train and it was a steam train and it needed to stop for 10 minutes. And so about 500 of the family and parents of these young soldiers who were gonna go off to war, to World War II, they gathered cakes, and food and uh, gifts and books, Bibles, whatever they had, this community, to give to these young men. And they all gathered there and they waited, supposed to come at 10 o'clock, didn't come, supposed to come at two o'clock, didn't come. Finally, a train rolled up at six o'clock, yay! Our boys are there! And they get there and they find out, whoop, it's not the 134th Infantry. <laughs> it's not their boys. It's not their soldiers. And so you know what they did? They gave what they had anyway. And they said, you're, you're fighting in this cause. Who knows what the future's gonna be? We wanna give you 10 minutes of hospitality. Basically, it was like the church said, we wanna give you 10 minutes of heaven on earth. <laughs> and so for those 10 minutes while the train was being serviced, they gave these things. And all of a sudden, one person um, reflected on this, the beauty of this event and said, you know what we're gonna do? This train stops with all these soldiers. They didn't know that over the course of World War II, six million soldiers were gonna go through this train station and they formed a canteen. And that little canteen functioned every day from Christmas 1941 till April 1946. And in a town in Nebraska that had a population of 12,000 people, they served over six million troops. I, I captured a little video of it, and uh, it's just uh, 90 seconds long, but it'll give you a little picture of what these devoted workers did. It's an amazing feat. So let's see if it'll come up on the screen. Just before we got to North Platte, one of the MPs on the train came up to me and uh, uh, said, this next stop's gonna be something you'll never forget. And I said, what do you mean? And he says, it's the North Platte Canteen. It'll be the best stop you ever made across the United States. It was just as if they started a factory here, a war factory. Instead of making bullets or making something else, they made food for all of us coming through. And I had a glass of milk because we didn't have milk very often in the service. Uh, I had a glass of milk. I had a beef sandwich made with homemade bread. I had a cookie. I had a donut. They offered me pie. They offered me cake. They offered popcorn balls. Then they had fruit. I just can't get over how pleased those people were that we would accept what they were offering. I no sooner got off the train and a lady walked up to me with a birthday cake and asked me if it was my birthday. I told her it wasn't. She said, we're gonna make it your birthday here in North Platte and handed me this beautiful birthday cake. It was an atmosphere. Uh, that you felt when you got off the train in North Platte that uh, made you feel like you were a hero. I just love that. Decades later, the guy's voice breaks with emotion. <laughs> and he says it was an atmosphere <laughs> that when you got off that, plane, that train, <laughs> you felt like you were a hero. And friends, I, I think about that, a population of 12,000 people in that town, it really started with one person, 
but mobilizing this town, it said that it, that mobilized 125 other regional little communities, served over six million troops. Well, I, I've been trying to compare numbers, and let me just tell you this. The population of New London Township is not six million, it's 6,000. And if you, if you take 12,000 reach six million, you know how many it takes to reach 6,000? It takes 12. <laughs> 12 people can reach, with that kind of commitment, uh, isn't 12 an interesting number? <laughs> Didn't somebody already think of that number? <laughs> 120, give me 120 people who say, I will labor, I will be a worker, I will figure out where I can find space to do the work. You know, that, or, that rolls up to 60,000. <laughs> If you get 1,200 workers, you touch 600,000 people. I'm not talking about just our church. I'm talking about a kingdom movement. And you know what gave them staying power? Is that, that they recognized that they were part of a sent movement. These, these soldiers were being sent into war. I think of especially our, our youth and children's ministry. I don't think of that exclusively, but I think of what a, what a parable that is. These youth, these children, going forth into, undoubtedly, a world that is going to give them strong headwinds against what it means to serve Jesus Christ. We just, can we think that we owe them less than this town of La Platte, uh, Nebraska, felt they owed soldiers going into a, a physical war? When we view our children going into this kind of spiritual war, and can we say, they need a body of adults that overwhelm them. They need a, a body of people who, who show up, who sacrifice, who invest in the life of a teen, who invest in the life of a middle schooler, who invest in the life of a child, and, and, and who do what, whatever it takes because, because we're in this battle together. <laughs> And as high as the stakes were in World War II, we know the stakes are even higher in this battle that we're in. And, and our role, basically, as the church of Jesus Christ, if we'll have it, if we'll not simply be a convert who says, Jesus, I want you in my heart, but if we'll be a disciple who says, Jesus, I want your heart to beat in me. Our, our role is that we want to be part of a movement that makes it nearly impossible to get from Chester County to hell. You know, there's lots of roads to hell in Chester County. And our role as the church is through intervention, we are burning up hell's bridges. We are closing hell's ticket offices. We are discounting and leafleting the entire area with books and arguments that are not books and arguments. We're not just leafleting them with information, but with lives that are better than books and arguments because they're based on, on showing the reality of the truth of that. And this is how the gospel comes to people. And this is the movement Jesus founded. This is why we gather. This is why the church is still the tool of God for reaching this broken world. And Jesus is looking for the people who he looked on with compassion. If you say, I have received the compassion of Jesus all the way to, to the bloodstained cross that he went, all the way to, to the reckless love, not reckless because he didn't know what he was doing, but reckless because he was willing to forfeit all of his safety, all of his comfort, uh, to live a life that he didn't have to live, to die a death he shouldn't have had to die, he did that move by compassion, and then what he wants to do, he wants us to receive it, and then he wants us to transmit it. And he says here, and I want you to note that, it's, it's not like we need a big recruiting plan. It's not like we even can do it. He says, pray for the workers. And, and you see how close it is? He doesn't say, we need to assemble them, we need to create them. He says, they're already there. But he says, what we need to do is pray, as it were, that there would be a fire lit under us, all of us, myself included, that there would be a spirit given fire lit under us so that we live out the life of Jesus Christ. And if you're a believer, that means, yeah, you also pray for yourself. You take responsibility and agency for your own spiritual life. 
Paul said to Timothy, he said, Timothy, it's your responsibility to kindle afresh, afresh the work of God in you. You need to kindle it afresh. If you're in the doldrums and you're down, you need to, you need to find someone to pray for you. But he says, not to muster up your own resources, but he said to tap into the resources of the God who has a mission that he wants to accomplish and who is willing to use the likes of us. Friends, that is the calling of God. And Jesus would call us to pray now. And I want to invite us to do something a little unique. Uh, before we sing that closing song, I just want to invite you, if, if you're able to do this, and, and if not, maybe you, just, maybe you just lift your hands up where you are. But if you'd like to, I want to invite you if you'd like to kneel. I know our, our benches don't have a huge space for that, but if you'd like to kneel as an act of consecration before God. If, you're, if your pew won't let you do it, you can even come up here to the front. And I'm gonna just lead us in a moment of renewal and rededication to the Lord who has looked at compassion of our lives. And to say, Lord, I'm re-enlisting. I, I want my life to be laid out that way. And so I invite you either, if you wanna lift your hands, if you wanna kneel where you are, I'm gonna kneel myself. And we're gonna do what Jesus said. We're gonna pray for ourselves and each other for the work of the ministry he has. Let us pray. Oh Lord our God, it's because of your compassion that salvation came to us. Not only did we not get what we deserved, we got the opposite of what we deserved, your grace and kindness. And Lord, we don't want to simply be recipients who never pass that on or who live a life of fits and starts, but mostly we just pursue a life of pleasure for ourselves. Lord, we want to be the laborers the laborers for the harvest that you were preparing. Oh God, we pray that you would kindle afresh the work of the Spirit of Christ. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would fall upon us as individuals and upon us in this place. We pray, Lord, for a day where no longer are we eagerly looking for people to serve in ministries, for those that are being formed. Lord, we, we think of the children. We pray that the new problem will be that too many people are coming forth and we can't sort them all out and get them trained. Lord, we pray for the vast number of homes this morning that really give no thought of worshiping you. And we obey this text not by praying that you'd somehow fix them, but we pray, Lord, that you would jolt them out of apathy because they would see our earnestness. And God, we pray. We pray that there might be that kind of counter-cultural Holy Spirit originating power from lives that are gracious because we are astonished at how gracious you've been to us. Oh God, this, we are so thankful. You don't put us on a guilt trip of responsibility. But Lord, you call us to a life of such exquisite and beautiful meaning. Thank you, Lord, that we have breath and life. Thank you, Lord, that we get an opportunity to live lives of purpose and meaning for Jesus who is worthy of it. And Lord, we pray that there would be a new obedience in prayerfulness. We pray in this season, Lord, and that you would bring expression to that that is life-giving, that is persistent, that is faithful, that builds and builds. Lord, I see meetings devoted to nothing but prayer. 
I see gatherings for renewal. I see that in your word and I pray that reality for us as a people. Lord, mobilize us in the name of our perfect shepherd, Jesus. Answer this according to your great compassion and willingness. Lord, just sustain this prayer as now we come before you in this closing song. May this, may this strengthen our prayer and may we offer these words as a heartfelt prayer to you in Jesus' name. And together God's people said, Amen.
Oh, the great blessedness of knowing Jesus is that we get to work for him. And so the same God we've experienced here is the God who is in our lives as we depart. We've entered this place to worship. We depart to continue that worship in serving and in glorifying him. And so we're the workers. We're team workers. (laughs) And we go forth in faith. And I invite you to lift up your heart to this God who promises to empower and thrust us out, (laughs) sending us out into his harvest field. Lift up your hearts and receive this word. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.